Welcome to part seven of uh, this course on risk management for farming enterprises. And in this part seven, we're looking at attribute number one of the risk definitions. Remember, in part six, we did look at three different definitions of risk. And we actually did underline some of the weights in all the three definitions of risk that we did uh, look at. And so what we want to do in part seven is to look at the first you know, attribute that we did pick out from all those three definitions. So attribute number one that we did pick out from all those three definitions of risk is that risks can either be positive and positive risks are described as opportunities or they can actually be negative, and negative risks are actually called threats. So what we'll now look at is a few examples of what can be deemed as positive risks from a farming perspective, and what can actually be deemed as negative risks or threats in the farming context. So the first risk that we're looking at as an example, is pest you know, outbreaks or diseases. Now, I must actually indicate that from my 10-year experience, especially from horticulture farming perspective, even poultry, because I think that's where I have quite a lot of experience, is that pest infestation or diseases is one of the killer punches or risks in any farming enterprise. So, at the time of shooting this module, we just got relieved from an onslaught of some pests in one of our core crops, which is cucumber. Those that are experienced in cucumber farming or any other cucubit family, be it zucchini and the cucumbers themselves and different kinds of cucumbers, we will know about two of the menacing diseases and pests called one powdery mildew. This is the whitish substance that you see on the leaves of most of the cucubid family of our crops. And then the second one is called downy mildew. It's kind of related to powdered mildew, but the infestation is different. And in our case, we've actually seen that this has become an annual ceremony, if you like. Every time the rainfall comes, in the case of Zambia, you find the rainfall that comes around sometimes October, November, but usually around December, January, February, we always have an issue with down mildew. And this is something that we actually cross-checked within our farming ecosystem. This is quite a huge menace. You actually lose quite a lot of crops from these two diseases. So these are just an example uh, of the two kind of pests. If you are actually a cabbage farmer, you will know that uh, there's a notorious diamond black moth. That's another menacing pest. And if you also look at tomato farming, which is one of the crops that I actually used to farm some years ago, tuta absoluta is also another menacing one that really affects tomato production. So this is one set of risks that can actually be deemed as negative risks. The second risk is regulatory changes. But I must actually indicate up front that regulatory changes can be both positive or negative. How can regulatory changes be positive? Let me just give you an example. And at the time again of shooting this video, the southern part of Africa has been hit by a phenomenon called El Nino, which is characterized with less than no more rainfall pattern. And what has actually happened is that there's less productivity on the staple food, which is maize. And so as, as 
part of trying to create remedial measures for this, the government has actually announced that they would put a waiver on some of the import-related duties on irrigation equipment. So that is actually a positive regulatory change. And remember, when we talk about positive risks, that is a huge opportunity for the farmer retrofit your farming enterprise. But from a negative perspective, one of the great examples that I can actually give is the recent protests by the farmers in the European Union. Well, obviously stating that the compliance costs to the EU Green Deal is actually costing them quite, quite a lot. So basically they're saying there's excessive environmental rules. That is a regulatory change that is impacting negatively on the farmers, hence these protests. They're also protesting against the EU subsidy rules, such as the requirement to leave 4% of their farmland under fallow. So obviously, that from a biodiversity conservation perspective or climate change perspective, tillage is actually encouraged. And if you can actually leave some land under fallow, that means there's regeneration of that land. So that is what the EU Green Deal is actually trying to achieve. But then the farmers think that's pushing them a bit too far. So that is one classical example of how regulatory changes can actually impact negatively on your farming endeavors. And so these two pest outbreak and regulatory changes are some of the classical examples of potential negative risks or threats in your farming uh, endeavors. Let us now look at positive risks. Remember, the attribute here says risk can either be positive or negative. Now we're focusing on potential positive risks, which can actually be deemed as opportunities. So the first one is called technological advancements. So if there's any technology that comes into the market that helps you to do your farming better, then that can actually be a positive risk that you can actually seize as an opportunity. For those that are in dairy farming, if you have got a big head, you've actually seen that now there's machines that you can actually use to do the milking, which is very good. There's also quite a lot of cattle theft, and I think there's technology now that actually helps you to tag the different animals so that on the app, you can actually see where the head is within the farm. In our case, one of the classical examples of technological advancement that we actually see was around land preparation or seedbed preparation. I think all of us traditionally, we've actually come from the tradition of using the hoi as a legendary tool for our farming, especially land preparation, even weeding in the fields. But if there's technology that helps you to do a much better and quicker job, then obviously that becomes a positive risk that you can actually seize. So we had a situation, even ourselves, I think for the first three years of my farming journey at Panuka Farm, we actually used to use hoys for land preparation in combination, obviously, with animal-drawn plow. But then we actually saw that there was this uneven growth of the plants in most of the fields. Why? Because sometimes when the team is, 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 is tired, sometimes actually not tilling, but then they're just covering with a bit of a fine tooth on top of a pan of soil. So once you plant, whether it's maize or any other crop, you actually realize that the root formation is not even across all the plants because of the fact that there's this uneven land preparation. So that's where technology can actually come in to help you in terms of even land preparation. And in our case, we actually bought what is called a bed former, which is a three-in-one technology. And what it does is that if once you've done the plowing, and then you remain with some of those big clothes in the fields, you go in with a bed former. The first thing it actually does in front is that it pulverizes those big clothes. Then immediately after that, it actually forms the beds for you. And by the way, you can actually adjust the width of that bed former depending on your preferences and the crop that you are about to plant. And then it also helps you to flatten the beds, especially if you're actually doing drip irrigation. Beautiful stuff because immediately you're actually done. You can actually begin to lay your drippers, hook them. And then 
off you go, you're planting. But other than just the speed, there's also quality, and quality is manifested in the fact that there's very even tilth of the soil. And you actually see that once you plant, there's this even growth of the plants in terms of general outlook, and that is where technological advancement can actually become a positive risk. Now, obviously, you might be asking, why is it a risk if it actually does such a good job? Remember, with machinery also, uh, in project finance, there's what is called um, white elephants. Now, white elephants in project finance basically is defined as, say, an asset that you procure, and somehow it doesn't rise to the occasion, like it doesn't do the job that it was envisaged, and then it basically just begins to gather dust and rust because it's not fit for purpose. So yes, you may have actually thought that it will help you, but in the end, you realize it can't. Now imagine, naively, you start like that, you buy a tractor and you're doing open field farming, and then at some point, you migrate into, say, greenhouse farming. And then that humongous big tractor of yours cannot get into the greenhouses. If you don't sell it, that can actually potentially become a white elephant on your farm. Because now, the dynamics have changed, and what you probably need is something much smaller to have access to your greenhouses in terms of land preparation. So that is on technological advancement. I hope you get the different nuances, the juice around potential positive and negative aspects around technological advancement. Let's look at risk number two, which can be a huge opportunity, and that is climate favorability. How does this become an opportunity? There are certain crops that do very well in certain environments and weather pattern. There's actually what is called a planting calendar. Now, one caution I must actually indicate about the planting calendar is that if you just go and consult Professor Google, get any planting calendar, you're actually bound to make a huge mistake if you don't check the context in which that planting calendar is actually applicable in. So planting calendars are actually very contextual. You've got to look at exactly where does it apply. Sometimes even some of the big countries, there's what are called agroecological region or zones. So you find each agroecological region has its own planting calendar. So just make sure that you, you get something that is in your context Otherwise, you may be in Africa and then you get something from Alaska. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, that's just a classical example. So one of the examples is like, say, cabbage farming or any of the brassicas. They generally do very well in the cold season because then one of the menacing uh, pests, which is the DBM, diamond black moth, will actually not hit you that much during the cold season. But once it gets warm, you certainly have quite a huge tussle with the likes of diamond, you know, black moth. So in an event that the weather or the climate favors you, you can actually go for a kill and expand your cabbage farming or any other crop that is favored in that climatic environment. So that is where you can actually take an opportunity and grow a lot more given that the climate favors you. So I hope it's very clear how these different you know, risks can either migrate to being positive or negative, become threats or opportunities.